Christ. The Bible. <clears throat> All right. Philippians uh, chapter 2. And <clears throat> we're going to start at verse 12. And in fact, let's just go ahead and read 12 through 18. <clears throat> Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings that you may be blameless and harmless children of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Um, in verse 13, it says, for it is God who worketh in you. But, you know, notice verse uh, 12 says, to work out your own salvation. Then verse, the next verse says, for it is God that worketh in you, <clears throat> both to will and to do of his good pleasure. <clears throat> and so uh, from that, we begin to see that there is a, a, par there is a participation, there is a part that we play but that part is to uh, grasp the Lord, to partake of the Lord, because his part is to will and to do in you. And that's what it says, you know. Um, so to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling isn't you doing what Jesus is supposed to do. Does that make sense? You work out your own salvation, for it is God who, is wor who works in you. He's working in you. And he's not just at work on you, but in you. Because to work in you is to will in you. Because it says, it is God worketh in you to will and to do. And so salvation is not doing the right thing. Salvation is Christ, and by gaining Christ as life, you are saved from a million things in this life. I mean, not counting, you know, afterwards. <clears throat> um, so, and in verse 16 we have, it is by your holding forth to the word of life, and that's one of the translations that I read, um, <clears throat> It's, it says, holding forth the word of life, but it is actually a comma just before the word holding. And, uh, and so they translated this as, it is by your holding forth to the word of life. It is as you hold, not, not as you hold forth to the doctrines and commandments of the Bible. That's, that's the old covenant. That's the Old Testament. That's the Jewish way of doing it. This is, it is by your holding forth to the word of life. Because what he has been communicating since verse 5 is, let this attitude which was in Christ crucified be in you, and that only comes by, as we had on the board before, the original. The original. If you're wondering why everything got erased, but this picture right here, Josiah felt that it was nicely done. <laughs> Not necessarily spiritually significant, but nicely done. So thank, thank you, brother. <laughs> Which can't be said for a lot of my drawings. <clears throat> All right, um, these two verses are about life, for it is God at work in you. It is by holding forth to the word of life. The emphasis is on the life. Now 
you, uh, you know, it, while it has gotten down to this place where it is emphasizing the life in us, it has already explained the kind of life by the previous verses. Do you understand? The kind of life is this selfless, self-giving life that you have bowed your knee to, that you have confessed that should be Lord in my life. So now he's not going back and trying to re-explain everything. He's building upon the fact that we've gained that reality and that knowledge from the Lord uh, to this point. And now he can just point to this is the word of life. We hold to this life. <clears throat> and this life is what works in you. This life is what wills and does in you. <clears throat> um, uh, so these two verses are about life. The first is life in Paul, and by that life bringing about an enabling willingness and doing. The next verse shows how that is practical. Doing without murmuring and arguing. <clears throat> All right. So now we're, ref we're hearkening back again to, you know, uh, verses... One through four, uh, let nothing be done. Doing all without murmuring and arguing. Let nothing be done through strife and vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Do you see how this is all this is all interwoven together? He has not left the theme. He has not departed from the truth as it is in Jesus. He is communicating the same thing. And he's trying to get them to see that this is very practical as to how you proceed. So, you know, doing all without murmuring and uh, arguing is very identifiable with Christ crucified. Not just doing the right thing, not just doing for God. But the, but the tail side of the coin, not doing. And, and those related to not arguing, not doing these things, um, let nothing be done by strife, etc. <clears throat> All right. The next part of life is the word and is what is preached as life. Because the word, the word is preached as life, not a book to be obeyed. Now, I know, you know, I know, and I say that, but I say that to make a contrast to make people at least sit up and go, what? You saying I ain't supposed to obey the word of God? Well, the truth is, if, if, if uh, verse uh, 12 and 13, especially verse 13, is true, then it's not you willing and doing anyway. Right? The word of God is true. The word of God stands. But Jesus is the fulfillment of the word and literally is the word before there was a book called the word. Right? And if you got Jesus, you got, you, you don't, uh, you know, I'm going to say it like this, you don't need a book. Now, I read my Bible and I carry a Bible with me all the time and, I suggest you do the same. However, you know, um, I remember when I was in Bible school and this guy said to me, man, have you ever read this translation? It's called the Living Bible. I said, dude, we need the Living Word. Because at that time I was already realizing that a translation of what he means is not what I need. I need the living word, living, the living God. David referred to the Lord as the living God a lot. The living God. <clears throat> All right. Uh, the way to be considered blameless and innocent as children of God, <clears throat> we would think, um, let's see, verse 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the, the children of God. We would think, that the way we do that is by doing everything right so that we're, when we stand before God, he goes, you did good, you did good, you did good. You're, 
That's totally out of context of what he's been talking about this whole time. And so he is saying to them, the way to be blameless and harmless is to do all things without murmuring and arguing, um, to um, let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but by Christ crucified proceed. The head side of the coin is by doing these things that are Christ, but let it be Christ. Do you understand the pattern shows us, the pattern shows us what should come out of us if it's Christ. Do you see that? Does everybody see that? But the pattern is not what you follow. Christ is formed in you. And by him demonstrating this pattern of, of, not, of doing without murmuring and strife, of, of not you know, uh, you know, doing all things without those kind of things or, or all the things that we've discussed, then you can know that it's Christ. Because you can copy that for a while. Most people don't even try to copy that because they don't even know that's the pattern. They're just trying to, they're, they're trying to uh, perform miracles and pray for the sick and them get healed and this is what they call Christ. You know, however, in the book of Revelation it says, you know, what's it talk about? Well, when the Antichrist comes, uh, he'll do miracles and stuff. And by, how's it worded by, because he does, you know, so many miracles, people will be deceived by that. Because miracles are not the criteria for the life of Christ. <clears throat> Selflessness is. Miracles are not the essence of God. Selflessness is the essence of God. And it may manifest in praying for the sick and them getting healed. Can you see that? It could manifest that way. But most people who are looking at healing are not looking at that as a manifestation of selflessness on the part of Jesus, of Nazareth. They're seeing it as a miracle from God. They're not seeing it as a man living with God in the inside of him and living selflessly. They're seeing all of that as just God is with us and look what he's doing and stuff like that. And so, you know, people will pray for a miracle very selfishly because they don't understand the essence. They'll pray for healing for somebody so that they'll get glory. They'll look good. They'll look holy. They'll look like they're of God. And yet Jesus chose the cross to not look like God and when when it exhorted, well, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross, or, you know, I could call 10,000 angels. He thought it not a thing to be exploited that he was equal with God. That's not what I do. I don't exploit the benefits to my benefit, the advantages to my benefit. I lose. And again, just to just recap, as the son of God, he didn't have to go the route that he went. He chose the low road. But he chose that because it's more akin to who he is. All right. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 19. Um, we'll read 19 through 24. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Um, <clears throat> him, therefore, I hope to send presently as soon as I shall see uh, how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. All right. <clears throat> so... Uh, here we have Paul. He's writing this from prison. Remember, this is a prison epistle. He's writing this from prison. There is a very real, real chance that he can die 
the persecution against the Christians hasn't fully blown, but it's, it's on, right on the edge. And he died under Nero as being the, the, the Caesar when he was killed. And we know Nero, you know, was the main guy who started, you know, he, you know, you, most of you know at least the story of um, Nero played the fiddle while Rome burned. Well, it was over half, I, I, it was a huge portion. It might have been as much as 70% of Rome caught on fire. And, uh, <clears throat> well, Nero blamed it all on the Christians and that started the persecution. All right. <clears throat> so I, I'm just giving you all that background to know that Paul's sitting up there, he's in Rome, he's in prison, he could lose his life, and listen to him. Uh, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. There's that spirit. There is that spirit. It's a perfect identification of that spirit that is not exploiting its own benefits for its self-advantage. It's not writing them and saying, well, do this or fix that or help me or get me out of here. <laughs> you know? But rather, he's, he's totally not even in that sense cluing them. He's saying, you know, I'm sending my right-hand man. I'm sending Timothy to you. And my comfort is when you're coming. Isn't that exactly what he said right over here to the, the Philippians? You know, fulfill you my joy. You be like-minded, having the same mind, one accord. Uh, look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. It's that same spirit. And he's doing it in that spirit. And he's got that spirit. And he's demonstrating that spirit. He's not just preaching it. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you can preach it. But Paul is literally in prison. He's, his own life is at risk. And he's sending someone who would be of a great comfort to himself, to them. And he's saying, you know, I, I'll be comforted when I know that you're okay. And let me tell you, this pattern is major throughout the Bible. We just never, you know, saw it for what it is. So then he says... And notice, he never leaves the theme. He hasn't left the theme yet. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Here we go. He's got nobody that is just of the same mind as him that naturally, by essence, will care for your state by selflessness. So I'm sending that one to you. <laughs> He's so thinking selfless, I don't even know what to say. Sorry for the term, Texas terminology, but it's just incredible. But he's not done, you know. Um, <clears throat> for all seek their own. So here we go. Here we go. We're seeing this contrast. Uh, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Jesus Christ. See? So he's saying, seek not your own things. You know, Jesus didn't seek his own things and seek to exploit that, but he became as uh, self-enslaved for the good of us. And he went down, and so here you, you have this process again, but you, but you have Paul not identifying good deeds. You have Paul identifying essence. And the essence that he's identifying is this, this thing that he calls Christ crucified. That's what he calls Christ crucified. He's not calling Christ crucified an event 2,000 years ago. He's not calling Christ crucified the fact that you died as Adam with Jesus. He's calling Christ crucified this, uh, this at work in this one he calls Timothy who uh, would be a comfort to him, but he sends him away to them and he has only one thing that will make him comfortable to know that they're all right. And he says, I know I've sent the right guy because I have nobody that is like-minded. Let this mind be in you. Be like-minded. This, this is a term that he used up just before he presented the whole thing. I have no one like-minded. What kind of mind? What, what, like-minded in what way? Who will naturally care for your state. Who will naturally have by nature. Naturally comes from the word nature. Essence. Being. You see that? This is... This is, this is all coming forth 
from this very selfless giving that Paul has taught and preached and shared and those that traveled with him heard it over and over and they knew what he was saying. We try to interpret his writings. They knew what he meant, you know. And, um, um, and then, then he shows the contrasting side of that. For all seek their own, not the things that be of Jesus Christ. The things that be of Jesus Christ is selfless giving. Well, they're not doing that. What are they doing then in contrast? Seeking their own. Does that make sense? All right. <clears throat> okay, let me just read this. Paul is facing possible death but is sending help to them. He tells them that his happiness is premised on news of their well-being. And though facing his own demise seems more concerned for them, the law of contrast is at work here as he mentions others who seek their own interest. Because he's sending, he's sending someone to comfort them, not seeking his own interest. That's exactly what was described as let this mind be in you. Don't y'all see that? Can you see that? That this is exactly, uh, he has found the pattern and he believes that to live this way is Christ crucified. <clears throat> um, so the law of contrast is at work here as he mentions others who seek their own interest. Timothy and Paul are slaves unto death because he says, uh, uh, he hath served with me in the gospel. Interesting words because it's the same one that he used for Jesus who in self-enslaved himself and Timothy has self-enslaved himself, and Paul has self-enslaved himself for the gospel and for others. And so um, Timothy and Paul are slaves unto death as Christ. Timothy has the negative and, and the positive, not just seeking his own interest, but that of Jesus Christ. The tail side, I'm not seeking my own interest. It, you cannot, folks, you cannot have a coin without both sides. You cannot, I hear people say, you know, well, I'm seeking the kingdom of God. I say, but Jesus said, seek first, you know. Or I say, they say, well, I'm seeking the kingdom of God. Yeah, but what else are you seeking? Well, you know, I'm seeking the, you know, this, this and this life and this and here. You understand what I'm saying there? They're seeking, you know, it's like, it's like Israel in the Old Testament in a lot of different places where you'll be reading that, that you know, the, and they, they set up, you know, the, the worship in the temple and they were seeking God and everything, but their high places were still up there. Did you ever read that? And, it, and it's really a lot in there. And you go, well, what the heck are you seeking there? You know, I mean, thank God I wasn't the leader. I go, dudes, we're either seeking God or we're not. This is not, you know, this is not possible in the currency that God trades in because it's two heads and it requires not just that you don't seek your own, but you seek the things of Jesus. Not just that you seek the things of Jesus and whatever else, but not your own. Yes. A two-headed coin is counterfeit. Mm. It's also worth a lot of money. Anyway, that's uh, sorry. So, uh, you know, and that's, that's really, I mean, that's really a good point because there is this counterfeit, I, I don't know how to explain this. I keep using these terms coin and currency because I saw that God only, he has one economy. And we think, we got, I don't know what words, what concepts we have with that word economy, but it means that he functions in one particular way, as it were, with one particular currency, and that currency is Christ crucified, and Christ crucified is a pattern of heads and tails, and it requires that if you seek Jesus, that you not seek the things of your own. And it's very well explained in verses one through eight. Very well explained. And now all he's doing is reiterating in life situations, this is, look, Folks, I'm, this is not a teaching. This is what we do. <laughs> this is how we live. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, 
not just seeking his own interest, but that of Jesus Christ. Christ's interests include that we care for others, for God and for others. Christ's interest means that we care for others. And that, folks, listen to me, means that we may suffer. We may go through humiliation. We may go through death to care for others. That's Christ crucified. That's the one Paul's pointing to and going, okay, let that be in you. Okay? Not some ethereal Jesus that's good and, you know, but, you know, I'm going to dabble over here, whatever. And, you know, and I'm not, even, I'm not even condemning dabbling. I'm condemning not getting the coin. I'm condemning not receiving the essence of Christ that will produce life in such a manner that does not dabble. It's the only way I know how to put it. <laughs> you know. All right, so, gosh. Uh, let's wrap this up. Verse uh, 25 through 30. <clears throat> Yet I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my need. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed, he was sick near unto death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I mean, this thing's just full of the spirit. Uh, I, send him, I send him, therefore, the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because, in reputation because, for the work of Christ, he was near unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Anybody see it? Yes. It's incredible. And, and we just, we left Timothy. We're, now we're just talking about Ep. Uh, Epaphroditus. That's what they called him back then. But. You know, we're not talking about Timothy anymore. We're talking about this group that traveled with Paul. And they're, what's of reputation to them is exactly what was of reputation to Jesus. He made himself of no reputation in that he didn't exploit his advantages as God and became self-enslaved. <clears throat> it's just a short paragraph here. Uh, Epaphroditus is their servant and Paul's. This is, he's, he's has enslaved himself as in the manner that Jesus did when it says he became a servant. But trust me, it doesn't mean servant the way we do. It's been translated that way so we don't offend, you know. But that's not, it means a slave and a full-out slave. It's the same word used for slavery everywhere else. Anyway, um, uh, <clears throat> Epaphroditus is their servant and Paul's, but he is doing service on their behalf. And his concerns lie with others, with them. That's what, it, that's what it's showing, that his concerns are not about himself, but them. Like Christ, he is obedient unto death for the sake of others, not regarding himself. And this is totally the picture that Paul has painted. He's pointing now first to Timothy, first to himself, then to Timothy, and now Epaphroditus, and saying, that is Christ crucified. Yes. That's what Christ crucified is. That's what he's saying. This is it right here. This is the mind that you're supposed to have in you, not, you know, a bunch of, oh, you know, yeah, we died with Christ and Adam's dead and all that, you know, that doesn't produce this essence. I mean, listen, please. It, just knowing that doesn't automatically pr produce the essence that is Christ crucified. It's talking about it. But it doesn't necessarily produce it. There has to be a hunger beyond mysteries. A hunger unto the Lord that would know Christ crucified in this manner. In verse 4, uh, in chapter 4, 14, let's see. 
They are commended by Paul on what grounds? Fellowship and suffering. I get, let me just see if I, because I was writing a bunch of stuff. Here. Uh, I, you know, I didn't check this before I did this, so let me make sure. I think it's, I think it goes along with what was said down here. Um, uh, verse 29, receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such, this is, uh, I'm sorry, Philippians 2:29. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ he was near unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. They had a lack of service. They were not service ministering. They were not being self-enslaved to the degree of ministering to Paul. And so they were, uh, so Epaphroditus saw that, and he was one of them, but he traveled with Paul, so he self enslaved himself to Paul on their behalf, suffered, went through everything that they went through because it was Christ to him. Does that make sense? Yes. Is, that, is, that, is there a clarity to, to some of that? <clears throat> All right, so, um, so I mentioned they, uh, they are commended by Paul on what grounds? Fellowship and suffering and their giving. Paul saw it, and this is chapter four, actually, it's there also, but we're not, we don't, I don't want to confuse you. So um, Paul saw it not as a love gift, but as an offering done by the life of Christ. And didn't he say that here somewhere? That as a, uh, I should have marked that verse too. Uh, verse 17, yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. The, the, Paul didn't see this way that he was living as the Christian life. He saw it as the fulfillment of the offerings and feasts. And he saw it as Christ fulfilling that in him. That's what he saw. And if you follow Paul and these guys around, they're not saying we reject Judaism. They didn't reject Judaism. They rejected what wasn't Christ. And he says in certain places, well, I'm, are they Jews? I am too. He didn't say I was. Because to him, it's, it's not a change of religion. It's coming into the reality that that was only a shadow. And Christ is the reality, and that's what Hebrews is all about. All right, let me. Uh, this is the offering that pleases God. It was done as a servant is obedient, following the pattern of the mind of Christ. All right, let me, uh, Lord willing, um, turn with me to Philemon. I wanted to give you a, an example outside of this, and there are a million, but I don't have much time, um, so I picked a little book that, hopefully would not be a problem. It's on uh, page 1309. <laughs> In my Bible. Okay. Um, <clears throat> most of you know the story of Philemon. I'll try to give you a quick rehearsal. Uh, 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 Onesimus is a guy who is a slave and he was Philemon's slave, okay? Well, Philemon became a Christian and, and began to follow the Lord, and Paul had led him to the Lord and everything. Well, Onesimus became a runaway slave. He ran away, and he left, you know, his master, but he got caught and thrown into prison, and guess who's in the prison there with him? A guy named Paul. So Paul leads him to the Lord. Paul led them both to the Lord. So now Paul's writing from prison, and he's talking to him, or maybe he's not at this time from prison, but anyway, he's writing to Philemon, and he's trying to give him the right way to proceed. All right. Folks, without saying it, the words Christ crucified, the right way to proceed is... 
Thank you. One person. <laughs> All right, so, <clears throat> let me, so, so I'm not going to read Philemon. I'm just going to go over this as quickly as I can. Philemon was shown the way in which he should proceed by Paul in this situation with Onesimus. In the view of Paul, for Philemon to not proceed in the way of Christ crucified would go against everything the cross represented. It would go against the life of, the life of Christ as imparted to us. And it would go against the faith that believes in life out of death. It, my God, folks. To not go the way of Christ crucified would violate everything that's sacred to God in, in, the, in the gospel. <clears throat> All right. Um, Philemon had rights. And that's something I think is very important. You have rights. Philemon had rights, but is called upon to act in the way of Christ and him crucified. He's, he's called upon to exercise his right to go the way of Christ and him crucified. Anybody catch that wording? Very specific. Paul says in there, um, let's see, I am bold and said and mark these because I knew I was going to be throwing this in the end. Uh, verse 8, wherefore though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee being such as one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Oh my God, I don't, I don't know if you get it. Uh, Paul had authority as an apostle, but did not speak on that basis, but willingly gave it up and became a servant, a slave, he said, and an old man and a prisoner. You see how, what light he put himself? He didn't put himself as a, an authority. Well, I've got the right and I, I can tell you what to do and this is the way you should proceed on this. He totally made himself just an old man in prison. Um, <clears throat> Paul had authority but did not speak on that basis, but willingly gave it up and became a slave in his approach. Just as Jesus was God, he became as a servant. Even so, Paul is an apostle but makes himself lower in order to fit the pattern of Christ because fitting the pattern of Christ, meaning letting the original manifest through you in the true pattern, y'all following me, was more important to Paul than fixing the situation. And he believed that this was the true way to fix the situation, even if it didn't happen immediately with people going along with the way it should go. <clears throat> All right. So um, to Paul, the higher road the higher road is that of Christ crucified instead of apostolic authority. He has the right to exercise his rights by not using them. It is his choice. He's not robbed of it. He's not robbed of it, but like Jesus, willingly lays it down. See, this thing of you don't have any rights is just not true. You got more rights than you can, I mean, you know, especially being in, born in this country. <clears throat> but there's something higher. There's another way to exercise your rights. And that is by choosing the right not to use something to exploit it for your benefit. Um, <clears throat> So Paul appeals in this way because Philemon also has rights as a slave owner. But he does not use his apostolic authority to override Philemon's authority as a slave owner. So I'll follow that? He didn't, he, he could have said, well, I'm a, a, an apostle. My God, I'm an apostle. You're just a slave owner. Uh, you know, rock, paper, scissors. You know, I win. <clears throat> um... Instead, Paul would have him proceed by Christ crucified also, because Paul is, by laying down those rights and along with responding out of love. If Onesimus has incurred a debt, Paul takes again the crucified path and offers to pay the debt to his own loss. Anybody see the pattern? So clear. 
And it's not, I'm telling you, it's not just this book. I am telling you, I am blown away. It is so deep and thick. And yet we read stories and we just read right over stuff like Epaphroditus and Timothy and we just we don't see Christ crucified. We just think that's a little historical note. Let's get into the theology so I can get the meat of the cross. Shame on us. Um, in this way, he is an example of Christ crucified and hopes that Philemon will move in this manner as as an expression of Christ crucified also, because that's what he's appealing to. He's totally functioning in the pattern of the coin, Paul is. And he's appealing as an old, imprisoned, he's literally laying down, not exploiting his rights. He's doing everything that he taught, he, he taught him over in Philippians. <clears throat> um, all right, so I'm, I was going to write this on the board, but it's the same pattern. Uh, Philippians 2.8 says, Though in the form of God, Philemon uh, 8 through 10 and 14, though in authority enough to command this duty, though in the form of God he can have his way, that's Philippians, that's talking about Christ crucified, the mind in Philemon, he's saying of himself, though in authority enough to command this duty. And he said that clearly in verse 8, but I've got down here verse uh, 8 through 10 and 14. So there's a lot of proof that Paul's saying, I have this right, but I don't use it to my advantage. Okay? I'm hoping you'll go with the Lord, but, but if you do or don't, I, this is what I'm going to do. Philippians 2, 6 through 8, did not exploit his equality with God. Philemon 8 uh, through 10 and 14 again. Yet because of love, I appeal to you. I do this as an old man and now as a prisoner. I mean, that's getting low. That's putting himself low. That's making himself of no reputation and hoping that Christ crucified will move him, not apostolic authority. Yes. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. But emptied himself, became less, and, and in that way, God became human, and then from there became a servant among humans. Philemon uh, 8 through 10, I appeal to you, prefer to do nothing without your consent. And that's what he says in this book. He says, I prefer to do nothing without your consent. This is an apostle getting down on his knees, folks. Uh, it is voluntary and not forced. As Paul sees it, Suffering, loss, and self-abasement and bearing the failures of others are all manifestations of Christ crucified in the life of the believer. That's what he calls Christ crucified. He wants his own life as well as all other believers to be ordered by the cross. To become weak, and I use that in parenthesis, to become weak in this manner to Paul is to express Christ crucified. To become weak, to become Paul the aged, Paul the prisoner, and literally make himself weak in this situation where we would use whatever we got to get done. Even if we say, well, I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing this for the good of the body, folks. Listen to me. Anybody hear that? This is for the good of the body. So I use this authority or I use this and I will push you into this or I will browbeat you into it. And you say, well, aren't you doing that with your preaching right now? No, you've got to want Christ. You've got to want him. And there's no need to command something that you can't give if you're not going to ever conform to the image of Christ in this way. <clears throat> um, to become weak in this manner to Paul is to express Christ crucified. Self-sacrifice and suffering loss is part of what his understanding of being identified with Christ involves. He suffers the loss of all things for Christ crucified. He in the spirit of Christ, gives up rights, reputation, self-respect, titles, all so that he may gain Christ in this selfless manner. So it is living in this sacrificial manner that he loses those things. It's by living in this way that he's losing all this stuff. But it is exactly the same manner that he is gaining Christ crucified. All right. That last sentence, I'll read it again. That last sentence 
is the explanation of the next chapter. I count all things but loss for the excellency of knowledge. Uh, though, I, you know, though I was a, a Pharisee and though I was one of the great ones among them and everything, I count it but dumb that I may win Christ crucified. Because he's never left the theme and he's showing the pattern again in his own life to gain Christ and, you know, it's incredible. I don't have a chance to get into it, but I mean, he goes all the way down and he starts talking about uh, being made conformable to his death. That's where, he's, that's where he's going. That's the Christ he wants to know. That's what he ends up with. <clears throat> so, um, so it is living in this sacrificial manner that he loses these things, but it is in exactly the same manner that he's gaining Christ crucified. <laughs> it's just... Sweet, isn't it? Yes. Isn't it just sweet that you, you're actually losing in this life, but you're gaining the most precious thing that God ever offered us, Christ crucified, to live in us, that divine nature. We think, I'm a partaker of the divine nature. I'm a child of the king. I'm, you know, all the stuff we go off on, the madness. It has nothing to do with the reality of Christ. So, you know, I apologize that I, I'm not going to get to finish this out, but I feel that, um, I feel like the Lord told me, you know, it's like every semester I can just go another semester. You know what I mean? I mean, I can just do that forever. Uh, I, my biggest prayer is not that I teach you all of this out of the scripture. My big, biggest prayer is that you see Jesus and then you start seeing it. And beyond what I see, I mean, I mean honestly, I, I believe some of you will see far beyond the Lord that I see. And that's my prayer. And that's why I go into death. And that's why I don't run from death. I don't love death. I don't kiss it in, in the way that, you know, in my flesh. But in my, in my being, I embrace it fully for your sake, for the gospel, for the kingdom of God. And, it's, and, if, and if I truly believe that this is the only way for life to spring forth in the church, wouldn't I embrace it with everything I can? I mean, wouldn't you if you really saw this is, I know for sure. This is it. This is the God's not going, okay, well, the Baptists have one way and they got one. And this, and this little church, they just chose to go the way of death and they're stupid, man. They could be enjoying the, the good things that they're giving up. But we're, but we're gaining Christ crucified. We're gaining the true meaning of that. Even if other groups kick that name around, bantered back and forth, when it comes right down to it, God, that's why I call it the word of life. We hold to the word of life, not the word of deep mysteries, doctrines. That's not to put anybody down or anything. It's to want Jesus' life more than we want knowledge of deep mysteries. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I have no love towards anybody. I just want Jesus, you know? Well, Randy, you're a madman. I am, because I just want Jesus. That makes me an insane criminal, but I want Jesus. <laughs> you know? And I believe that you guys do too. That's why you're here. You wouldn't have stayed this long unless you really want Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time together, and we just... Uh, we just want to be made, we just want to be brought to the place where our knee will bow to this and our tongue will start confessing this as Lord in our life. Father, forgive us for all the misinterpretations of your scriptures that we see everything glorious for us and never see the true glory. Even when we see the glory of people calling you Lord and bowing their knee, we miss the true glory of your essence. We only see that if you're the one made big, then we ought to bow because you're God. Father, help us to see Jesus and to conform to Jesus and to help us to want, because you said, you said that it is you in us to will 
So we just want to embrace that and claim that right now and say, Lord, even if we're not willing, it's not about us willing it. And we step out of that role and we say, will in us, for it is you in us to make us, to bring us to willingness and to doing. So we look away from the deed unto the doer, your life within. We ask you not just to do things through us as if we're a glove and you're the life, but rather that we are partakers of that same mind, that same attitude, and that we are in agreement with what you mean by the word of life, what you mean by Christ crucified. Father, keep our hearts tender and hungry. Let every time we gather, not be gathering in a classroom, but in our hearts, gathering at your nail-scarred feet. May we, before any class even begins, may we bend down and kiss those nail scars in your feet and say, I, I see, Lord, I see, not just an event that happened to you. I see why you are still scarred to this day, that even in resurrection you showed him your hands and your feet. Oh, so that they wouldn't just see a risen, victorious, healed being but they would see a self-giving one. Father, beyond our words, but in the gracious power and loving conviction of the Holy Spirit that works upon us and in us, bring us into these realities of your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. We're dismissed.